Hi there, Christian Henson from Spitfire Audio here. I want to talk to you about surround because I think it's going to become increasingly important, mainly because these things are not going anywhere. And what they can do is basically simulate Dolby Atmos. I don't have a Dolby Atmos system. I don't think it's an essential setup for you to have as a media composer at this time. I think working in this spectrum is good enough for music. There are definitely things that you can do, even if you don't have a surround setup of your own, to prepare for something that is being delivered in that format. So what I'm gonna take you through today is how to configure a 5.1 setup if you have one, how to uh, consider surround signals if you don't. There are some rules that really should be obeyed if you want your mixes to translate and some creative uses of surround. I've been using surround for about 23 years now, so I've got lots of fun tricks alongside some do's and don'ts. Now, obviously, YouTube is a stereo format, so if you want to hear some of these demonstrations, I'll bounce out a 5.1 version linked in the video description down below. I'm gonna focus in on Polaris, which is a new collaboration with BT, and it really is fantastically suited for surround applications, alongside how to use stuff like orchestral, etc., etc. So, what is 5.1? Well, it's actually six speakers. We've got our left, our right, our center, our left surround, our right surround, and our LFE, which is basically our sub bass box. LFE stands for low frequency effects. And that's gonna be really important later on. There are different standards to how you configure these outputs. And I'll just show you how we've got it configured here at Spitfire compared to how I have it configured back in the shed. So left, L, comes out of output one, right out of output two, center out of three, got the left surround out of five, right surround out of six, and LFE out of four. The way that a lot of engineers like to work is in pairs, particularly if you've got stereo faders. So their preferred way, in my experience, is left on one, right on two, left surround on three, right surround on four, center on five, LFE on six. I guess the most intuitive way of doing it would be one, two, three, four, five, six, but I think that you will find that problematic. Again, just thinking about things in sets of stereo with two monophonic signals being the C and the LFE. So let's leave it like this for here so I can actually monitor and hear what I'm doing. That's the stereo version. If you don't prepare surround sound for a surround sound dub where they mix dialogue, music, effects together, then this is what's likely to happen. What they'll do is take a rather rubbish reverb and put that in the surrounds. If you want to be in control of how your score sounds, it's well worth thinking, even if you don't have a surround setup, well worth thinking about stuff to give them. Simply create a delay track for them. Another way would be to put a delay in the surrounds. So that's a slightly more sophisticated way of doing it. But what I prefer to do is to create an alternative synth image for the surround, something that maybe is slightly less bright, is more ambient. What I'll do is just copy this down and then copy down another version. Put that out of five and six, which is the surround. Let's take these auxiliaries off. 
And then I'm just going to basically mess around with this. I'm going to do it first so you can hear it in stereo. I'm just going to change the sound up here. Let's reroute that. Absolutely loving that. So let me duplicate those two. and just show you how I get those signals to really feel like they're related or of the same kind of animal, if you will, or machine. And what I'll actually do is set up a couple of good quality reverbs here and here. Now, this is going to be the surround reverb. And then this is going to be the front reverb, left and right. And what I'm going to do with the surround, so let's use the same reverb. So I'm going to use the Vienna Hall for that. But for the rear version, I'm just going to make it a little bit longer and also alter the distance there. So let's have a listen to that. So what we're doing is reverberating the rear pad into the front speakers and the front pad into the rear. It gives this glorious kind of spatial ambient sound. Currently using left, right, left surround, right surround. What about the other two speakers? Well, I'm about to save you a lot of money. Really, as composers, we ostensibly work in quad, and I would really advise against making much use of the C and the LFE. The LFE, the clues in the title, low frequency effects. Film sound people use it for incidental moments. It's a bit of extra whoop. They don't like having it completely full all the time. It interferes with stuff like room ambiences or indeed explosions. So you absolutely mustn't use LFE as part of your bass management. I would say the odd Tycho. If you've got a really swelling moment with some sine wave bass, then use it then. But the problem that you will face if you use the LFE too much is the dubbing engineer will simply mute it and you will probably lose again a true transfer of what you have prepared and what's coming out the other end. Now, the centre is even more critical. It's where all the dialogue goes. Quite surprising, wouldn't you think that dialogue would be in stereo? Well, no. You've got to imagine these massive barns that these films play out in. Imagine if you're sitting all the way to the left and you've got one character blaring out of the left speaker and then you can't hear the character who's blaring out of the right. So it's presented in the centre speaker so the whole cinema can hear it at some kind of uniform value. And as a consequence, sound people hate it when you put instruments in the centre speaker. So all I will do with the centre speaker is just a modicum of splosh. This is to prevent black holing. So if, again, you're playing in a massive big barn like an IMAX or something like that, it doesn't give this sense that the music's there but isn't there. So all I will do is create another reverb, and I'll put it out of 3-4, and I believe it's set up so it's 3. And I'm going to pan it to the left so it's only coming out of the centre speaker. So what we'll do is we'll go large, Vienna, and then I'm actually going to reduce the decay time here. And then shove it right back. And I'll send all of my signals to that. 
So we've got our front signal going to the back reverb, the back signal going to the front reverb, and both front and back just tickling the center. If your engineer, dubbing engineer, feels that there's too much going on in the center, i.e. there's too much reverb, they can confidently turn that down with you not losing any musical material. So sticking a shaku hachi in the center speaker with lots of reverbs and delays around, that's a really dangerous enterprise. When working with orchestral material, often, certainly with Spitfire, you'll find that we have got a selection of mics and this is an opportunity to really give a true sense of space. And what I'm gonna do is open that in a multi-output mode here. Now, if we look here, you've got a little plus sign in Logic. What I'm gonna do is make that come out of the surrounds there. And then if we go into this mode here, I'm going to delete the mix, use the tree for the left and right, maybe a little bit of close, and then I'm gonna use the ambient mics, which are the mics that are really far up in the air and further away from the tree. I'm gonna use that out of this one here. It just sounds absolutely amazing. Let me lay something down so you can hear that. Now I'm going to duplicate that and as with all orchestral samples engineers will always add a bit of reverb to that and what I will do in that instance is use the same principle so we'll send the front out of the back and then the back out of the front. That sounds great. Very kind of natural Hollywood type of sound. And then both of them just a snudge out of center. So we've got the front coming out of the back, the back coming out of the front, and both of them going to the center with that really ducked back. So are there differences of use between TV, film and games? I would say yes, nuanced difference. In film, you have to basically account for people watching them literally on their phones, at the speaker of the phone, all the way up to like the Chinese theater in LA, which is the mother of all barns. With TV, you are basically relying on other people to set up surround systems correctly. And because you're in a much smaller space, you'll probably find that people will be so much more proximate to the different speakers. So you don't want to be blowing out Grandpa Joe's ears with loads of surround stuff. You have to be maybe a little bit more conservative. The most fun you can have is with computer games because it tends to be one person sitting in the sweet spot. So they don't worry about all of the complications caused by big barns or indeed tiny rooms. Which leads me on to a very important point, something that I would strongly advise against both for film and for TV is putting live, dry, rhythmic signals in the surrounds. Now for film, it's simply about the speed of sound, which is relatively slow. So what happens when you put rhythmic content that's dry, say for example, a drum kit, out of the fronts and the surrounds, is you get this horrible flamming effect. I don't know if you've ever been to a festival and you hear, and you're kind of far away and you hear all of the speakers working out of phase. Well, that's the kind of effect that you would create in a big barn. There's also something that dubbing engineers don't like, which is called backdooring, which is where you basically distract people from the front and they look behind them. Putting like a dry voice behind is going to naturally make a human being turn round. They don't like that. With computer games, all bets are off. And in fact, for Alien Isolation, my brother Alexis and I, we recorded the orchestra twice, front orchestra and back orchestra, which was incredibly indulgent. 
But that doesn't mean to say that you can't have a bit of fun. So I'm going to show you three creative ways of using your surrounds. Let's get this little bad boy back down here. And what I'm going to first do is my tracking technique. It's similar to vocal tracking, where you're getting the same sound, but different samples to play exactly the same thing. So let's pull this across here. And I'm going to duplicate it. Take all of this gumph off and make that come out of this one here. And then what I'm going to do very simple, is I'm basically just going to tune it down an octave. That'll do for jazz. Duplicate it and then transpose it up an octave here. And again, you can add reverbs to really cook that together. But also, you can have a lot of fun by maybe doing something like putting it a little bit out of tune to give it a trancey distance between the two signals. Now that has a really immense fattening effect, but also kind of makes your brain want to creep out of your nostrils as well. Another trick I like using is what I refer to as someone else's reverb. So what I'm going to do is just get a piano up here, and I'm going to duplicate that and get up another sound, like mm, chimplin. Okay, And then what I'm going to do is put reverb on that. Let's use that hall setting again. But at 100%, to what, just for fun, I'm actually going to put a 100% delay on the front of that as well. Let's make it the same. There deviation. Let's record that down. So what I'm going to do is just so that you can really hear this in stereo is just lay it down first just so it's coming out, you know, both signals are coming out of left and right. But it sounds really quite magical when you then put it out of the rear speakers here. Another technique I enjoy let's duplicate that piano, is what I call my rising sparkly crystal delays. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go piano, delay up an octave, delay up an octave, delay up an octave. This is going to add loads of latency into your arrangement. You have been warned. So let's find ourselves an empty bus. Six. Let's put a bit of splosh there. And delay. I'm going to pitch it up with my old favourite. That out of the surrounds. And then sending that to another bus with exactly the same gubbins on. Out of the front this time. And then finally, another bus. And again, out of the surrounds.
that really has to be heard to be believed. A lot of fun. And naturally, you can just temper it back so it's not too crazy. Now, if I only had a stereo system, how would I prepare signals and work with 5.1 in mind? Well, I would simply create, say, a bus at, I don't know, let's go to like bus 100. So we're well clear of everything else. And let's do so all of that and that coming out of bus 100, which is here. And then what you can do is simply work in stereo. I want to pull it back to almost imitate the slight distance away from you. And then basically when you finished working, you simply do a bounce down with your surrounds engaged. And again, you can send just a little tickle of reverb to the center speaker. And basically, if you want to put a Tyco in the LFE, you can set up a separate bus for that also. So to find out more about Polaris, check out the video description down below. It really is a, an absolutely phenomenal selection of 2022 ambient orchestral warped pads going through VHS machines and Fairlights, a really rarefied signal path with an all new granular engine. Fully recommend that. But I'd really like to hear about your cheeky and creative uses of surround. And which system do you like? The L R L S R S C L F E or L R C L S R S L F E. Is that right? Let me know in the comments down below. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do. Lots of exciting stuff coming up. Ding the bell to be notified the next time we put up a video. And one of those for the poor center speaker. Can't be that much fun just handling dialogue. See you next time.